Now it's really easy to get caught up in this whole Republican versus Democrat conversation. The donkeys versus the elephants, the conservatives versus the liberals, or even the reds versus the blues. After a while, it's like a blood sport, like the Crips and the Bloods, because people hate each other. But let's give it a deeper analysis. Because see, if we do, we can see that the real political conflict is ideological, and it's between nationalism versus globalism. So let's explore that. Now, the idea of nationalism states that our country should put its citizens first over all else. That international cooperation should be a distant second in favor of the well-being of this country's inhabitants. But in America, the contradiction is that nationalism has never worked for non-white people because it's a flashing neon light for white supremacy. And we can see a very clear line from the origins of the American political structure straight through white supremacy. And we currently live in that system today. So we've already covered the reality that non-white people were considered less than people. And they were never really a part of the American experience. We think about the struggle of indigenous people combined with the struggle of American Africans. It's been completely contradictory to this idea of American national identity. In fact, during the greatest immigration period in the late 19th and early 20th century, European immigrants flooded the American shores. And when they did, they were often encouraged to abandon their European ethnicity in favor of a new American identity, a white identity. And we even have a name for it, it's called the Gilded Age. Now, at the same time, the Germans and the Polish and the Austrians and the Irish and the Italians were settling in communities all over the country, the indigenous people were being pushed further west to reservations. In the South, lynching became entertainment and sport. And the American Africans that had privilege, it was because they were sharecropping. And it wasn't really privilege at all. They were confined to this Jim Crow law system of the South. So this idea of American national identity completely skipped over the earliest non-white residents of this continent. The benefits of first and second generation, in fact, produced demographic increases in white America. And it began to help generate what we now consider as white wealth. Conversely, during most of the 20th century, non-white Americans had to endure unbelievable struggles in economics, unbelievable struggles in education, unbelievable struggles in politics and violence in order to claim the promise of America. In fact, as an example, the appetite for watching movies that depicted violence against non-white Americans was insatiable. We'll discuss that more when we discuss entertainment and white supremacy. But for now, why don't you go Google Cowboys and Indians and see what pops up. So this idea of nationalism is really structural racism. Right? But what about globalism? Because we can clearly see that there's been a worldwide movement toward multinational organizations, organizations since the end of World War I. Uh, the power of the United Nations, it's definitely increased. And right now, it includes most of the countries on the planet. Now, on the surface, it may be a little bit more challenging to identify what constitutes a white supremacy agenda around the world. So let's consider a few things. One of the most powerful unions between countries in 2021 has been the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It has been and it remains that. Now, NATO was created in 1949. And when it was created, there were 12 founding members of this alliance. We had Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States. 
Right now, there are 30 members. Greece, Turkey, Germany, Spain, Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Albania, Croatia, Montenegro, and North Macedonia. Anything jump out at you? Look, if you look at a world map right now, you'll notice that the North Atlantic geographically actually begins in Northern Africa. Morocco is closer to the Atlantic Ocean than Spain is. But geography aside, what is the purpose of NATO? NATO has two purposes. It has a political agenda and a military agenda. Politically, it tries to promote democracy or the democratic values and empowers its members to be able to consult with each other and cooperate for defense of their own countries. But then there's also a security related system for them to handle their problems. It, it politically encourages trust and cooperation to prevent conflicts. So that's on the front end. But on the military side, on the back end, NATO says that it's committed to the peaceful resolution of disputes. Now, anytime you hear peace, think of war. If diplomatic efforts fail, it has the political might to handle the crisis. So we have essentially a club. And if you're in the club, you don't have to worry about the club. But there are other multinational organizations too. There's the South Atlantic Peace and Cooperation Zone. And let's, let's think about what South Atlantic means. So in that club, you have Angola, Argentina, Brazil, Cameroon, Congo, Gabon, Gambia, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Liberia, Nigeria, Senegal, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Togo, Uruguay. It's almost the complete opposite. It is primarily countries in Africa, in South America. But wait a minute, there's more. We have another world club. It's called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APAC. And just so you know, APAC is primarily South Asian and North Asian countries. Now, NATO had a 40 year head start because both APEC and the South Atlantic Peace and Cooperation Zone were founded in 1986. So we have a huge multinational organization with 30 countries in it, with the primary focus of peace and military prowess. That's global white supremacy. That club essentially says you cooperate or you get destroyed or you get annihilated. It's not a coincidence, people. Come on, fam. We can see it. So Dr. Welsing says to us, racism is a global system. So whether you are a nationalist or a globalist, you still need to watch your back and protect your neck because the system was not designed with you in mind. So if you're part of a marginalized group, what is your action plan, right? So we have all this information, right? We can see examples of everything, but what are we gonna do about it? Well, first, we need to start making our main concern not anti-racism because anti-racism is at the opposite of racism. 
It's not anti-fascism. Because anti-fascism is not the opposite of fascism. The opposite of both of those ideas is justice. And once we begin to seek justice and let that be our primary goal and responsibility, then everything else becomes clear. The laws of intention tell us this. The thing that you say you don't want, you're going to bring more of that into your life. So if you say anti-racism, you're going to bring more racism. But by seeking justice, you're going to work to create a just system for all. Now, what does that look like? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't look like. Smashing windows does not show that Black Lives Matter. Now, creating political movements is hard work. It requires energy, but it also requires intellectualism. And it requires leadership. So, if you are a leader and you are focused on bringing an end to political injustice and white supremacy racism, then you will begin to try to deconstruct some of these institutions. But I'm going to warn you, it's not easy. If you're trying to make a dent in the criminal justice system, you need to understand that for every black man, brown man, red man, or yellow man does that, that does not go to prison, that's one less police officer needed. Now, what happens when you reduce recidivism and all those men who are coming home do not go back to prison? More and more police officers lose their job. So there is a vested interest in keeping things the way they are. But one thing we can say for sure is that change can come. It usually requires blood, but Dr. King, Malcolm X, and several of these freedom fighters like them have shown that you can make substantive changes through planned strategic efforts. And one last thing, all media isn't fake media. All news isn't fake news. But remember, a lie is a lie is a lie. It doesn't matter if you hear it from your sister or your brother, your father or your mother. When you hear lies, call them out. Until next time, peace.